another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff, and this is our Star Wars show. Why? Because we talk about Star Wars. Makes sense? Now it does. It is a fun show today. We have a very cool council. John Campia, Obi-Wan, Obi-John Kenobi, and Mark 2D2, they're not here. They are out saving the galaxy, but I do have a really great council. She is the Smith Lord herself, Tiffany Smith. Hey, guys. Like he said, I'm the Smith Lord, and yes, this is a show about Star Wars. So that's what we'll be doing, talking uh, about Star Wars. Talking about Star Wars. <laughs> and returning, it's his second time on the council. Super excited to have him back. He is from Star Wars with friends, Justin Bolger. What's up, Justin? Hello. How are you guys doing? Glad to be back. Good to have you back, dude. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have fun today. So yep. if you guys have not tuned into this show before, what the hell have you been doing? But if you, <laughs> if you have or have not, please join us. Welcome. We are going to talk about Star Wars movie news first. Now, that's just everything happening in the world of Star Wars movie news. That could be Rogue One or Episode 7 or Episode 8. Whatever it might be, we're going to talk about it. And, by the way, if you haven't seen The Force Awakens, we're not holding back spoilers anymore. So if you're a Star Wars fan and you're watching this show and you haven't seen Force Awakens, again, I ask, what the hell are you doing? All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's start with Star Wars. Uh, Tiffany will be playing the role of Mark Ellis today. Tiffany. Christian, you so wanted to do it. You were like, I'm what? just going to go right into the news. I'm going to do it all no, myself. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I, was, I, want, I, was, I, just, I remember Mark getting ready to be the, the loud joke-telling self, and yet I have the, the lovely Tiffany here to go ahead and tell us some yeah, of the stories Yeah, I'm not gonna, I can't do it quite like Mark does, but I will do it in my very own Smith Lord type of way. So the first news story that we're gonna talk about today is the fact that episode eight has now been pushed back from May to December. Now, originally it was gonna be in December, then they moved it to May, then they moved it back to December. So. I don't know necessarily what this exactly means. There is now rumors that they're doing some rewrites on the script as well. Um, so first things first, how does this make you feel? Does it make you feel nervous about the new no, film? No, not at all. I love it. Um, one, you have to reestablish Star Wars as a pop culture phenomenon. I think they've done a very good job of that with The Force Awakens. And I think that making it a Christmas event, similar to the Lord of the Rings films and even kind of the Hunger Games recently, yeah. mm -hmm. is a great move. You make Star Wars a Christmas time tradition and... Christmas time is a time for family, and now Star Wars. Yeah, I agree. I think for me, I talked about this yesterday in Movie Talk. We talked about it today in Movie Talk. I have never been tweeted more about anything in my life than I was about <laughs> how do you feel about the fact that Episode Eight got pushed. And I'll tell you, I'm excited about it. I actually think it's a good move. I think it's the smart move. I think that it's because they want to focus. Obviously, they, they were hoping that fans were going to respond to Ray and Poe and Finn. Mm -hmm. And not only do we respond to them, we love them. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you want to fit that into, because you remember there was always a plan to further along episode eight. And it's like, yeah. okay, start working on it, Ryan. Do your script and you know we'll, we'll figure out everything else like later on. But he had a vision. He started writing it while episode seven was coming out, while episode seven was you know in theaters. And then it went, hey, Ryan, uh, they, they we love your script. Yeah. But can you fit these guys in a little more? I see it. It makes sense. So I'm on board with it. How do you feel? Um, I think two things. One, you look at it from a business standpoint, and they saw how successful it was with this film coming out in December. And for Disney, just to say, you know, let's do it again. Let's put it out at that time period where everyone's going to go see it. They've got a longer time to go see this film and enjoy it. Um, I also think it's, you know, we hear so much about the process of films now. Rewrites at this point are not weird. Mm -hmm. right. And I agree with the fact that you're saying, you know, they found out which characters people really connected with. And they're like, let's put more. Let's put more of that character that people love in there. Um, and I think it's, for me, we've talked about this before, but I'm, I'm excited because now I don't feel like I'm going to get overdosed with Star Wars. I don't feel like, like it's going to be... It's once a year, not every six yeah, months. Yeah, exactly. Which I, I know being a huge Star Wars fan might sound crazy to say, but... I really am excited that I'm going to have, you know, like you were saying with Lord of the Rings, it was once a year. It was an event every time it happened instead of, oh, this one came out. Okay, we only got six months. Now there's another one. Right, now yeah. there's another one. Well, Justin, what do you think about in terms to whether or not it has something to do with December before The Force Awakens, biggest opening was $86 million. Yeah. Now that is triple dis destroyed. You know, do you think that this is going to that, that this had something to do with the decision as well or do you think it was more about the script or what do you think the ultimate decision was why they moved it i think it's a balance basically of the two i think the business decisions that tiffany was talking about and then also making sure that you are building in the future of star wars 
the rewrites that are rumored are supposedly around the new characters, right? So before, they were really depending on the nostalgia of Star Wars to bring people in. Now that audiences have connected with That's those new point, characters, yeah. you are putting those new characters even more so in the forefront because those are the characters that are going to be around for the next 30 years, not the legacy characters who really got a lot of butts in the seats right. the first time around. That's a great point. Um, all right, Tiff, what's next? All right, so our next story is about, obviously, we said... Once seven came out, it was going to be all about the rumors circling around episode eight. Um, and so this is all about some of the cast that is going to be returning. Like Christian said at the beginning, there are going to be some spoilers in here. So uh, according to Kathleen Kennedy, she said that everyone who had top billing in the cast list of The Fourth Awakens will be coming back. So that's Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Adam Driver, Daisy Ridley, John Boyega, Oscar Isaac, Lupita Nyong'o, Andy Serkis, Donald Gleason, Anthony Daniels, Peter Mayhew, Max von Sydow, tons of characters, yeah. which like we said before, if you've seen the original, I mean, if you saw The Force Awakens, you know some of these characters didn't make it through. So that just leads me to believe we're going to get some flashbacks here. Um, and they're expanding the returning role for Gwendolyn Christie as Captain Phasma. Um, so I think this is, you know, interesting because it brings up a lot of things. And that's just some of the story. There's also even more stuff that we can get into about Benicio Del Toro yep. and how he's going to be developing the character. Um, and then obviously we'll get into those leading ladies as well. But first up, let's just talk about Christian. What does that mean for you? Are you excited at the fact that all of these characters are going to be back in the next one? Yeah, yeah, because I think I'm okay with, I know that it, people weren't really, weren't picketing or anything, but people were like, well, you know, they don't have flashbacks in Star Wars and they kind of did one with the, with the f force flashback ish yeah but it wasn't necessarily a flashback but i'm okay look jj abrams was known to use flashbacks and whether or not ryan johnson uses them i don't know but i'm fine with it i don't think you have to stick with the way that it used to be done if it tells the story the right way and you're going to be able to use han solo again that way or larsen taka again that way then why not i'd also like to point out by the way that this article that tiffany was just referencing was a great write-up by starwarsnewsnet.com who kind of broke down yep. everything that was happening in this world if you're not if you're not checking your news, uh, Star Wars news from Star Wars uh, newsnet.com, you really should. But um, I love the fact that they're they're returning. And the other thing is, I don't know if Trevorrow messed up on this one by accident, but he also <laughs> said that it was exciting for him that Mark Hamill and Princess or Carrie, Carrie Fisher, Fisher were going to be returning. Yep. So you know, maybe assume she's going to survive the whole way through now. But Justin, out of the people, you know, not the Benicio del Toros and uh, that we haven't really talked about yet, but out of the returning cast. Who stands out to you the most, and how do you feel about everybody returning? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say Gwendolyn Christie is Captain Phasma, not because of the hype that surrounded the character before the movie, but when I watched The Force Awakens, she almost stands out to me as the new Darth Vader more so than Kylo Ren what? does. Really? If you pay Explain attention. Explain yourself, sir. What? Think about episode four. Think about A New Hope. Vader is almost a sidelined character. He just has never a sense of never in a presence. trash dump, though. He's not. But <laughs> or just was like, sure, hey. I'll, take down, I'll take down the security <laughs> Justin, field Justin's around. Here, I'll Justin, do it. It's Justin's fine. here to take his lumps. <laughs> Sorry. But, but Vader takes orders from an old man, a bureaucrat pretty much in this movie. Yeah. He has a not really that sensational lightsaber fight. It was just that lightsabers were a new thing back in 1977, and people gravitated towards that. And it was more his menacing presence that really greatly expanded that role going forward into The Empire Strikes Back. Remember, the story was not all laid out like George Lucas continues to perpetuate out there in Star Wars media, right? right? So with Gwendolyn Christie coming back as Phasma in a greatly expanded role, you think about Phasma in The Force Awakens. She is thrown in a trash compactor, but nothing except for Chewie running into her out of nowhere is really played for laughs. So if you put her in perspective to Star Wars as we maybe thought Captain Phasma was going to be in this movie, then I sound crazy. But if you think about the few times that you see her and the fact that she still sticks out in your head, <laughs> if they give her a Vader-esque role in episode eight, similar to he goes from that uh, taking orders from a bureaucrat to killing everyone who doesn't do what he tells them to, Captain Phasma can be a breakout character in a way that I think people were expecting her to be in The Force Awakens. Go ahead, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> go ahead, nope. Uh, I want to I mean, hear. I want to the thing. debate. Let's go. I think that it's something where it's like they did build up this character to be such a big deal. And you talk about what kind of toys and figures came out before the movie came out. And if you're building it up for her to be the lead or a big character in the next one, why put out all the stuff for the first film? Like, let's wait until we do the second wave with episode eight and push that character forward then because this just made it feel like she was a, she was kind of a sissy like 
I'm gonna... There was no fighting. I wish that she had been the one, uh, that stormtrooper who goes up against Finn, because if that had happened, then I would have been like, okay, Nines. there's more story yeah. behind well, this. Well, I'm going to split the difference, and I'm going to say- No, you're not. Yeah, I am. You agree with me. Don't lie. <laughs> uh, what I'm Don't gonna, lie. What I'm going to say is I think that I, I, there's two, I see both your points, but the point that I'm going to go with is I think she's more like the Boba Fett of the series. I think for me, because yeah. if you, because if you go back and you include the special editions here, Boba Fett is in one scene in in the in New Hope when Han sees little cameo J- Jabba and he comes in he looks <clears> back <throat> he looks back with the with you know and he, he looks at the camera he Ferris Bueller's yeah. it and then he takes off um, that's okay that's it's a smaller role it's not the same kind of it's, it Phasma certainly had a more a bigger role than Boba Fett in the first movie but it was a setup to where okay this person is devastating enough to where she will just fire on a whole bunch of innocents okay. The reason I won't go Vader is because I'm never. I don't see Vader just giving up the shut shut it down, and then she okay. shuts it down. Now, but I can see <gasps> Phasma coming back and being someone like a like to where Boba Fett was a pain in the ass for Han Solo in The Empire Strikes Back, and ultimately grabbed him and, and took him and brought, brought him back to Boba Fett. And was hunting him and was the reason why he was he tracked him to Cloud City. I think that's going to be Phasma for Finn. I just had a really cool thought. You know how we talked about Maz Kanata saying that you know the force Mm -hmm. to Finn? Or in that extended edition scene that got cut out with Maz. She knows the force. But what if Finn does too? And what if he was using the force and he didn't know it? I don't want Finn to know the force. What if he did? What if that's why Phasma takes the force field down? Uh, That would make me happy. She's not weak-minded. No. She's not weak-minded. It it works on the weak. weak Weak-minded. I think think she's a strategist. She had a gun to her head. What are you going to do? She yeah. didn't think, and she even pays lip service to this in the movie, she didn't think that taking down the shields was going to really do anything. Yeah. And if you even look at the film, she's kind of right. They lead this, I mean, the most ragtag of ragtag groups to attack Starkiller Base. The Rebels in Episode 4 they fielded a way, but they got extremely lucky. Po, it was Poe got lucky. That was the thing. Is there that it wasn't, because even when those, that stupid theory from the Huffington Post about all the <laughs> plot holes, um, there was a great counter to that. And one of the things was like, they didn't just... To figure out how to blow the place up. Yeah. Poe had to get lucky. Poe got yep. inside of that thing, shot it down. Poe doesn't get in there. It's over. Yeah, they were running away up until then. Yeah, it's over. Like they they made their attack. It didn't. They did. It didn't work. They tried to attack it. It didn't work. But then, I just think that Phasma will be used more. That I think everybody's in agreement here that it's going to be a, a much bigger role. And I think that they're also very aware that she was somewhat of a disappointing character in fans' expectations. Yeah. Can I say, though, that she's a disappointing character only because of the expectations fans have based on what you were saying, Tiffany, which is the merchandising. 100%. At the end of the day, they just want to make money. Captain Phasma looks very cool. Putting her merchandise out there, putting her on a t-shirt, making an action figure of her gets them more money. But it's not but just it's that, a, though. But it's not it's just the action figure. It certainly has something to do with it. But it's also you cast Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn Christie. Christie. Yeah. Well, not only that, but the trailer, the first one we saw... That shot of her walking down the corridor, right. everyone was like, <gasps> who is that? Like, what is yeah. the impact of this character going to have on the film? And it really... Well, maybe there might be a greater plan. Fizzle. And, and you, can't, plan. you can't blame the movie for not doing what the trailers made you think they were going right. to do. Um, all right, let's talk about some of these other characters in here, too. So we got... Because Greg Grunberg, we know, is coming back. And we also yeah. know in his Wexley from the Aftermath series... Wondering now if we're going to see the more. I think it's kind of cool that even though I didn't love, and I forget, did you like Aftermath? I think there's a lot to like in Aftermath. I but, think it's just really it's, it's different. different. It's okay. different. Yeah. So, but I do think that I'm. I'm bless you. I certainly think <laughs> that Chuck Wending is has a has a little bit of a, a little leeway here in the second book because not only is it called Life Debt, and we hope we're going to get a Han and Chewie story out of that, but I also think now because people are a little bit more familiar with Wexley, that that's another character mm-hmm. now that he's working with and he's originated, so we're going to get more, more there, and I, I want to see what happens. So I'm, I'm very happy that Grumberg is coming back. Benicio Del Toro, I'm still, I, I'm okay if he plays a random bounty hunter that we've never heard of before. <laughs> I'm, I would be beyond thrilled if it turns out to be Thrawn. Um, I, I mean, like anything. Well, the rumor that I'm most excited about, which I don't know if it will be true, because obviously Del Toro had been talked about in the past to play Darth Maul. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that that trailer came out for Rebels and potentially we're getting a Darth Maul story in Rebels, it would be really interesting. He's, oh, he'd be old. He would He's be. He's old but now it, in Rebels. Well. Call me old. <laughs> yeah, but still, wouldn't that be cool? I, I, like, as I was saying, I think it was last week, I was like, I just want to see him being a badass with a robe on. And if that shot in Rebels is anything like it, if I could imagine Benicio Del Toro turning around like that, whoa, mind would be blown. Who would you want to see Benicio play? 
Uh, I'm biased. I do want to see him play a bad guy. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see him play against type and be a resistance or politician-y kind mm-hmm. of guy. Um, I'm going to say somebody connected to the Knights of Ren. The trouble is, I don't know if he would overshadow Adam Driver as Kylo Ren in that role. We'll see. He's the type of actor, though. I don't think that's a that's out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. I think it's very possible because we also are going to see more Snoke's base and yes. where mm-hmm. Snoke is and what he, he. There's no way Snoke's there by himself. He's got to have people around him. And obviously, if Kylo Ren and Hawks are out on uh, out, you know, fighting on other get in other planets, he's going to have someone to protect them as mm-hmm. well too. So why not a Benicio del Toro? And he's the type of actor that could easily, if he needed to, play down to Adam Driver because he also maybe understands and respects. Because we don't, it does, it doesn't say anywhere that the Knights of Ren are all force sen- sensitive. Mm-hmm possibly assume that they that they might be but i would like to see him do something like that like i said i i'm still hoping for thrawn but who knows <laughs> um what about some of these leading ladies that are rumored um i think kind of jumping off of that it's interesting because del toro was rumored originally to play darth maul and then the character got paired back there weren't as many lines and so that's why he bowed out right um so now circling all of these rumors about the leading ladies for the next film Similar thing could possibly be happening here where, you know, we've talked about the fact that they're getting rewrites, that they're focusing more on the characters that we know and love. So all of the girls that we've heard stuff about, Gugu and Belle and Gina and Tatiana Maslany, um, have been in and out so much that I don't know that any of these, any of the rumors where it's definitely this person or it's not this person, I don't know that there's any validity to any of them for me right now. There's crazy rumors going on with this role now, too, because it was like, oh, yeah, we got definitely got yeah. uh, every, Google's in, and then you have, uh, yep. who else? Gina Rodriguez, and now yep. she, they're both out from rumors right yeah. now. The rumor is that there's an unknown Asian actress who's probably going to get the role. Yes. So we have no idea. Next thing we know, it's Julia Roberts. Who the hell knows who's going to be? <laughs> and it seems like everyone is being referenced for this role. But uh, the question I don't is not which actress; it's who the hell is she? Exactly. Is she going to be Jane a Solo type character? Is she going to be someone brand new, just a love interest for Finn? Is she going to be both? What do you think? Here's the thing about Star Wars casting: is we get excited and caught up in, oh my god, who is this person going to be? <laughs> right. And then when you see them on screen, like in the case of uh, Maisie Richardson Sellers, they're there for two seconds and they don't have any speaking lines, regardless of whether or not their scenes get cut. They might have an expanded backstory in the uh, in the books and stuff like that. So I get excited because there's a lot of talent that we're talking about yeah. right now. But especially just having seen The Force Awakens, I can't help but maybe try and reel it back in so that I'm not disappointed later on when I see that person for yeah, five yeah. seconds in the film and no, and they don't say anything. Well, and I think it's, you know, you can look at it from both sides. As an actor, you're looking at it and you're like, all of these characters do have backstories because the world is so developed. There's no real character that even has a tiny scene that they probably don't have backstory yeah. written for. Right. So there is high potential that you're going to get to come back. But there is the other side of the coin where it's like you're in it for one scene and you never get to come back because you're already that character in the franchise. Um, so it'll be interesting to see because I, I do see for a lot of these actresses who are building their careers, it would be, you know, behoove them to get a role where they're actually really focused on in the films, which is why I think that, you know, someone like Gina Rodriguez, everyone's coming after her for tons of projects yeah. right now. So and, and Star Wars has been too. It was yeah. rumor for Rogue One, she was rumor for episode seven. Yep. Yeah. So if it were to be because the role got pulled back a little bit more and she's like, I'm I'm gonna wait until there's something that's more kind of substantial for me, that could be what's going on. Well, that plays into our next story, which is, of course, Sheena Rodriguez, right? What, yep. what's, what, give, can you give us a little bit more of the details of what's going on with that story? So there are a couple things going on. Um, Jeff Snyder from The Wrap and Meet the Movie Press said it sounds like Gina and Belle may be out of the mix for, like you said, another slightly unknown Asian actress. Um, Gina was uh, up for another film that's potentially going to be a scheduling conflict as well. Um, So I don't know what necessarily more information this gives us with Gina. I think obviously... As I said before, I'm like, I don't know what I believe about these rumors, but Gina is definitely someone that has had meetings. They are really excited about her. It'll just take a little time for us to see where she lands within the universe. What do you think, Christian? Well, I mean, it it stinks to lose a talent like that if they couldn't get her, you know, but I I also am not really worried about it because they're they're locked in on her. Now, whether or not she's going to be in episode eight or episode nine or solo or she's going to be part of the Star Wars family eventually. I think it's a given. I think that she was at the Star Wars premiere. Now, look, there are a lot of people at the Star Wars premiere, but it seems 
like, and Mark and I joked about it. It's like when a <laughs> college athlete is brought to a college, like, hey, look what we got here. Check yeah. it out. And, and that's kind of what it felt like when she was there. Um, so, and she Instagrammed that photo at an event with um, – Oscar Isaacs as yeah, well yeah. that was like one of my favorites it's just like a photo of the <laughs> two of so them she's, so she's pretty deep in the, in yeah. the family right now I think that they're courting her pretty hard so you know it, if we don't get her in this one we'll see her soon but am I wrong no I think you're you're 100% correct and I like that they are courting her if they have if as you said they're locked on her and they know that they re- I'm sorry they recognize her talent and they want to bring her into yeah. the fold then that's a good thing yeah. mm-hmm. uh, all right Tiff what's next so our next story is this is totally a rumor we do not know this for sure but that Christopher McQuarrie has been brought in for rewrites on Rogue One now if you don't know him he was actually the script doctor for World War Z which is one of my favorites when it came out um, he's just coming off of Rogue Nation Mission Impossible um, Um, He wrote Usual Suspects. Um, So him coming in, the rumor is that they brought him in right at the very end of pre-production. Originally, the rumor was that he came in after they'd already started filming, but now that was corrected and saying that he came in at the end of pre-production to help kind of polish up the script, which, again, is not totally unusual. This, for me, I'm excited about it because I love what he does. How do you feel, Christian? Said, don't be nervous at all. This is great news. It's Christopher McQuarrie, the guy. Like th- This happens all the time where people are touching up scripts in, in pre-production, and it happens. Mm-hmm. But the reason why you hear about this one happening is because it's Chris McQuarrie. That's why, because you want to hear that. Mm-hmm. You want to, oh, wait a minute, okay, the, the, the script was strengthened by the guy who wrote Usual Suspects and mm-hmm. the guy that just knocked out Rogue Nation. Yeah, okay, fine, that's perfect. And he's a Star Wars fan. So this, this is the guy that is going to be responsible for helping bring back Vader to the screen again, helping bring back, back Vader to the screen, and helping find out how those Death Star plans, you know, why wouldn't you, if you're Gareth Edwards and you have Macquarie say, hey, we're going to bring in Chris McQuarrie here, and I think you should do this, this, and this, and how about this, and you're collaborating him? I- I'd be all for it, but mm-hmm. what do you think? No, this this is absolutely the best part of Lucasfilm under Disney with the story group and other people being able to play in the sandbox other than just George Lucas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When there are issues, regardless of how maybe severe those issues are, or if you just want to make the best movie and the best script that you can, you can get a talent like Chris right. McQuarrie to come in and actually help strengthen a Star Wars film. I mean, like, you don't shoot off the first script? You get- <laughs> 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 Gary Whitta wishes you did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they want the movie to be good. And honestly, I think Rogue One, in a lot of different ways, is even more important than The Force Awakens was. This is going to be the movie that shows if the new plan for Star Wars is actually going yeah. to work. And point. how the legs are for the franchise going into the future. So I, I like the story. There's nothing wrong with this. I want to jump off that point. That is a phenomenal point because it, that that is exactly right. Because the saga films are going to hold on their own. People mm-hmm. are going to go back and see that. But the non Star Wars hardcore fan that doesn't exactly know what Rogue One is, they're going to say, "Well, what the hell is this? Oh, well, Vader's in it." And I think that's another brilliant part. You got to yep. put Vader in it. You got to sell Vader on it because that's going to get the oh, he's the most recognizable villain maybe of all time. You put him in there, and then you get a guy to strengthen it up. This needs to hit, and mm-hmm. it needs to... And from what they're saying, they're bringing in people from Black Hawk Down yep. and Zero Dark Thirty uh, you, you, and Saving Private Ryan. You do that combined with all these great talents, it's it's a smart move. Well, and I think you look at it, if, if they are doing some reworking to Episode Eight. And then looking at then Rogue One and saying, okay, is there stuff we can polish up with certain characters that maybe we're going to focus more on? And having an outside set of eyes come in and look at that script and say, okay, you want to focus more on this character. Here's where I could see you really punching up this one here so that way it leads to this other place. Um, Because I do think, as you said, letting other people play in the sandbox is nothing but great because... It is, you know, people will see things from different angles and be like, this maybe doesn't necessarily work so well here, but this would work really well here. So I'm really excited about it. All right, what's next? So as Christian mentioned, moving on, we're talking about Darth Vader's role in Rogue One. Uh, James Earl Jones is supposedly coming back to voice him, which for me is just the best thing ever. Um, It makes me really happy because I think that this is one where Sometimes you want them to stay away from characters Mm -hmm. that we know and love so much because you're like, oh, you don't have to consistently go back to the characters that we know. But with this story, to stay away from Vader would just be silly because he is involved in this story. He is involved with the Death Star plans. Um, So I hear this and it just makes me that much more excited. Um, 
I can't wait to see who they're actually going to put in the suit because we don't know. Is it going to be the same? At least we know we've got the voice. What do you think? I love it, but I'm convinced because this came. This report came from Making Star Wars uh, dot, dot net. Uh, net. Uh, I'm convinced that Making Star Wars is run by George Lucas, and that, <laughs> and that George Lucas is leaking information because it, they they get they get a lot of stuff right, and their track records records like ninety percent or something. It's it's really good, um, and so I, I buy everything that they're saying here that this is going to happen because it because of the fact that it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Going back to what I just said, you have to have Vader in this to not only because he's he's the one that it makes sense he's going to be there because of the timeline. He's in the story. It would be weird yeah. if he was not there. Going away from that, marketing wise, that's once we start marketing Rogue One, he's going to be a heavy part of the marketing, and he has to be because mm -hmm. you're gonna you want to really sell. Oh, it's that time period. Yep. Oh, I oh I thought Vader was dead. Oh, it takes place, but that that's yep. you're gonna start letting fans know. But James Earl Jones coming back, I think at this point was a given because of Rebels. Yeah. He came back for Rebels. He's back in Rebels, so I love that he's coming back. Uh, I don't think we're going to see David Prowse in the suit. He's too old to do it anyway at this point, uh, and he's got he's got to be a little bit more, more mobile if he's going to be a Vader at that age. So um, this is a gimme. I'm super excited. We finally get to see Vader the way we thought we were going to get him in the prequels. So I love it. Yeah, I, agreed. Uh, the only <laughs> thing that I would say, or the only thing I would add to that is his use. How they use him is going to be almost yeah. as important as the film itself. You don't want to use him too much. You right. want to use him enough. Put him on his shoulders and say, "Yeah, it's a Vader movie." Exactly. It's not a Vader movie. And I mean, it's like Dave Filoni says whenever he's talking about Vader showing up in Rebels. Mm -hmm. As soon as Vader comes to the party, it's over for whoever he's going up against. Right. So he can't be going up against the the group of characters that's going to be stealing the plans in a direct way. And honestly, I think that's an exciting thing because it forces talents again, like Chris McQuarrie, to think of new ways to use the character that we might not be used to, but that expand our understanding of him at the same time. I also think it's, you know, we know we know Vader the best when he's at his peak yeah. and mm -hmm. his biggest drop. Um, so this is a younger version of him. He's still kind of building up who he is in the world. So he could make some mistakes here. We don't know how it's going to turn but out. It's there not could too be much so because it is it is right around the area of episode four. It's probably yeah. like 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 either a few months or maybe a year beforehand. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. But it's like still... even when you do Lords of the Sith, the book, and you hear, you know, how Vader was with the Emperor. There's some stuff in but there that where was he's... five years after the Clone Wars. Well, but still, it's like him wrestling with things. I think there could be a little bit more back and forth Struggle. within yeah. his own mind that would be really interesting. He's well, not Empire Strikes Back Vader yet. No, so he's, yeah. but yeah. I would like to see you bring up the Empire Strikes Back Vader, and I think that a lot of people, and I think that it's 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 too bad that a lot of people haven't, or maybe they, I don't know what the sales were like on the book, but after, uh, not Aftermath, um, Battlefront, the Battlefront. Oh, uh, Twilight Company. Twilight Company, yeah. which is a book that I was very surprised by. And I want to really enjoying it. It is there. There is a first of all. That's the movie. I, the way that Battlefront is set up as a book is the way I want Rogue One to be as a movie. Yeah. And I think it's going to be the way that the the Twilight Company kind of they don't see themselves as this greater cause. They're soldiers. They're soldiers, and they've got mission to do. But when they run into Vader, it goes down, and like it, and it happens on Hoth, and he is devastating and terrifying mm -hmm. and the vader that we know that's the vader i want to see i don't want i agree with you i don't want to see him in a lot of different scenes and talking to all the you know it's it just it's all <laughs> on vader a couple scenes here a couple scenes there and then he's just killing rebels main event yep that's it so all right what's next all right, so our next story is focusing on Donnie Yen, who is in Rogue One. We've seen the photo come out, and he is saying his character is very important in Rogue One. Um, but that's pretty much all that he's saying. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, when the photo came out, there was some other stuff that Donnie had posted an Instagram picture of some of the helmets from Star Wars. He was asked quickly to take that photo down. Um, so I think he's very aware to keep things under the hat or under the helmet per se as of now <laughs> um he's obviously doing some press for it man 3 um and getting to talk a little bit about star wars as well uh this for me i'm so excited because i think he's an incredible actor and has such charisma and i think will bring a really interesting vibe to this character we don't know anything about him except for the fact that apparently he is blind right. um based off of the photo that, that we've photo? seen right. just from the photo yeah. um but no one it, nothing has officially come out yet mm -hmm. um so how do you feel kind of 
getting this little tidbits here and there from him speaking and just saying that his character is going to be really important. Well, I hope I hope so. It kind of maybe he even think he's like a mentor to the rebels. Uh, that that he's maybe you know Felicity Jones's character is maybe he she's like he's like her master or he not more mentor you yeah. know, or so. It would be interesting, and I like to almost maybe even see him have a Laura von. Uh, Help me Max out. Laura Santeca. Oh. Thank you. Laura Santeca. <laughs> I'd like to see him have something like that to where maybe he he knew the Jedi. He knew it. He's not a Jedi, but he mm. knew it because they because they made they made it pretty clear there's not going to be a lot of Jedi or if any Jedi at all in this movie. But it's funny though, as as I'm looking at this picture and as we're talking about Rogue One and, and talking about the moving of episode seven, uh, episode eight, I uh Rogue One really benefits from this move. It really does because it's because you don't the you also have to realize, you know, going back to that story of it moving, the marketing, like once you got to right around, because you usually start marketing a movie, a nice push, you know, between five, six months out to get a couple teases. And and if you put that movie out in May, mm -hmm. you're kind of almost overshadowing Rogue One. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now now you can focus everything on this movie and talk about the importance of a character like, like Donnie Yen and, and all these other characters. But I think that this is a movie that, the people that don't know, I think this movie is going to really hit. And if it's done well, it is going to do exactly what you were alluding to before. It's going to show we don't just need the saga films. We're going to do a lot more with this franchise. But what do you think about Donnie Yen? Yeah, um, I think he, of course, is going to say that he's very important right, to the film. Right. I mean, hi, I'm Justin Bolger, and I'm very important to this episode of AMC's <laughs> Jedi Council, or Collider's Jedi Council. Um, but I think his importance could lie in possibly the Force, to take a cue from what you were saying. He, he's obviously not a Jedi, or we don't think that he's a Jedi. But the opportunity here is to show that if he is force sensitive, then there are other ways for people to be force sensitive. Mm. You see a little bit of that Maz with Maz Kanata, Kanata right? exactly. Right. And even with Laura Santeca, who, according to the Star Wars uh, Visual Dictionary, is an adherent of the Church of the Force. So I think where his importance comes in, and again, this film's importance comes in, is the expansion of Star Wars. It's not just the saga films. It's not just the story of the Skywalkers and their friends. There are more people who live here, and it's bigger than even we know so far. And it's pretty big to us already, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a question I want to ask you guys as well, too. What, if any, questions will be answered or connected from Rogue One and The Force Awakens. Anything at all? Or will it totally stay? Will they will they tie anything together? Because some people are asking, like, you know, if, if, if Felicity Jones might be Ray's mom. I don't think that's the case. Who knows? But um, anything, and doesn't, nothing, everything at that grand scale. But do you think, Justin, that there's anything that could further the lore that we were introduced in Force Awakens or anything else? That's a good question. And honestly, not one that I had considered up until right now. <laughs> I think of the books and the comics that we get right now that have small tie-ins, but nothing that's so big that it'll change your understanding of right. the film so far. Um, I don't know, Shattered Empire, I'll take that comic. You know, we get a little bit of a look at Poe's parents, but nothing that when we're watching the movie is like, oh, so they were the ones who, you know, took that blade of grass and put it there right, or something right. like that. I think maybe that kind of stuff, like someone who could be related to someone in The Force Awakens. But nothing or, that ties in anything we learn. Nah, no, I don't well, think I mean, I think you bring up Shattered Empire and um, just that the parts where they're talking about the force trees yeah. what I had no idea there was anything like that mm -hmm. in the Star Wars universe so I think that there is potential when you're talking about a character like Donnie Yen or the rumor that we heard about Maz Kanata being able to be in touch with the force um, that I think if they're saying there's not going to be Jedi in this one there's going to have to be people who know about the Force and right. who are in tune with it in another way. Um, so I'm hoping that they flesh that out a little bit more for us in Rogue One. It's going to be pretty awesome, though, too, I don't need them to have Jedi in it, but I do want to hear, like, in the Campfire Soldier stories, like the legends of Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. Like, I want to hear that stuff. I want to hear them talking about, like... Yeah. And if they underuse Donnie Yen like they did the actors <laughs> from the raid, I'm oh, not going to be yeah. happy because right. this guy... The way he fights on camera. If you have not seen the Ip right. Man movies, go and see them. He was Bruce Lee's master and teacher. So this guy is so talented. So I'm just really hoping that they use him to the best of his ability. In I want to see Kasu Leach return, by the way. And I think he will because he didn't die. He got away. Yeah. yeah. Told yeah. that to Kanji Club. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> now we move on to the part of the show that's simply known as What's the Deal with Canon? Everything that's happening in the world of Star Wars outside of the movies. This could be the books or the comics, the novels, anything that ultimately ties back into the universe. We talk about it. It is the actual history of Star Wars now, the stuff that Lucasfilm and Disney considers canon. Let's talk about it. Tiffany, 
What are we talking about first? So first up, we are talking about the Star Wars Rebels trailer for season 2.5. Yeah. <laughs> um, this came out, and I think every single one of my Star Wars fan friends text and was like, this trailer is amazing. They dropped so much information in it. It was jam-packed with little Easter eggs, things that we can expect moving forward in this season. I know that you and I talked about it on the Rebels recap episode, but what did this trailer do for you? It goes back to my question I just asked you guys about Rogue One. That's why I asked it, because this trailer already gave hints towards The Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not it was the, the cross-bladed saber that mm -hmm. Ezra had, or... That's green, right, not red. Right, or if it was a voice that sounded eerily similar to Snoke, um, there... And then you have, you know, there's so many different things that they had. And then they also took from, you guys know, if you've been watching this show long enough or you're following me, my, my, me talking about Star Wars, I love the, the Old Republic era. There seem to be a lot what? of nods to the Old Republic in this trailer. Um, now, whether it's those, the, the, the guardians of the Jedi Temple or mm -hmm. whoever they are, or even where Darth Maul is hiding out, is that Mora band? There's so many questions in the, of course, the, the battle between Vader and Ahsoka that we've been talking about that's been, that's been leading up. We finally, we're going to get it. Um, the fact that you got to see Anakin in the holocron uh, and all, all of that stuff, and then Ezra going towards the turn to the dark. I still think that it, it we're sold on this thing, that it, he's going to the dark side. I know you have a different point of view here yesterday. You brought up a, a, a possibility. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, as a lot of fans came out and said, oh, this was a Force Awakens was such a nod to A New Hope. Um, I don't want to see the exact same thing happen here that we saw with Anakin and Obi-Wan. I don't want to see Kanan be the one who stays on the light side and then Ezra going to the dark side. Um, so I would be really, really shocked and surprised if somehow something happens and Kanan experiences something and Kanan's the one who ends up going to the dark side instead of Ezra. We don't know if Ezra makes it out of Rebels. We don't mm. know that yet. Right. Um, and just the fact that we're seeing Vader go up against Ahsoka, I mean, that for me, the fact that she does the voiceover for the trailer was so impactful because I'm like, this might be the last time yeah. that they can use her yeah. and do this because we don't know if she's going to make it out. Um, yeah. I'm going to, I have another point on that, but before we do, I want to hear, Justin, what were your thoughts overall on the trailer? Overall on the trailer is that what, what what an essential piece Rebels has really become of Star Wars, yeah. and it's only been around for two years. Yeah. It feels it feels like so much of a bigger piece of Star Wars than the Clone Wars did at this point, and the Clone Wars, I thought, was doing really well as they went into the second season also. I do want to really talk quick about uh, what you said about Ezra. I agree. I don't think Ezra's going to the dark side. I think that that story's already been told, and it would diminish the story of Anakin Skywalker, especially now that his story is so closely tied in with Rebels. I will say, though, I think it's a little more likely that at some point we're going to lose Kanan and yeah. that the story becomes a little bit more focused on Ezra after Kanan is gone. I think we're going to lose a lot of them, but whether or not who we lose first, um, Ezra's going dark, and if, if Kanan, and if Kanan, goes, <laughs> if Kanan <laughs> goes down, then he's definitely going dark. But I'll tell you why. It's not a matter of just following what Anakin and Obi-Wan did because that's what's happened in the history of the Jedi. It happens all the time. It's happened throughout history. And it happened in, in uh, Dark Disciple. It happened. It happened, you know, at, for, for a moment. People can come back from the dark yeah. to the light. It happens from the light to the dark. It's happened throughout the Jedi's history. That's what happens. The, the Jedi's who, Jedi who were tempted go to the dark side of the Force and some in more devastating... We, you also remember that Anakin Skywalker was like Michael Jordan... You know, he was the best of all time, and that guy went to the dark side, and then it all went to hell. So now we, we Ezra's good. He's not as good as Anakin. He's good, so we don't know where he's going to go. And will he be Snoke? Eh, I don't think so. But but Anakin was also being trained by someone who was trained. Not saying I know that, you mean. that yeah. Kanan is not a good teacher, but Kanan never finished. Exactly. So having Obi-Wan teach Anakin, I think – puts him in another level, but Anakin obviously was. And off of that the point, chosen. Anakin Skywalker, who was apparently too old at the time <laughs> to train, wasn't trained well enough by Obi Wan and went to the dark side. As where Kanan, who is not even a Jedi, really, he still was a Padawan when it happened, is training as with the limited knowledge that he has even more so it could be more volatile. That's what I'm saying. I'm willing to put that on it. I don't think it's not trained well enough. I'll put some bets. I'll put some bets on it. I, okay. I, will, I will actually take the, that I'll bet. Ezra's yeah. not going yeah, dark side. Yeah, I All agree. Right. I agree. I, well, 
Do I think he could play with it and come right back? If he goes once, you no, lose the no, 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 no. But no one he said he can't come back. But that to by that he's token, he's already to gone dark side. No, he yeah. hasn't. Yes, yeah, he, he was. Once, he, he was like, running uh, with the. I'm saying going to dark side. I'm not talking about saying like wakes up and says, you know what? I'm in a bad mood today. I'm going to kill some sand people. And then he does it. I, I, I'm talking about at least doing a little run as like a potential Sith Lord. A if run. Goes, like a, a run. run. Like, okay. You can so, have a run like he, and then come like back. He goes from face to heel in wrestling and then turns back. Vader right. had like, more than a run. He had a long run, but he came back. He came back. And so that's the same thing. Everyone comes back, and Ezra will go dark and come back. No. Yes, he will. All right. Oh, boy. All right. Let, let, uh, let's, let's talk about the next one. Justin, you're no, you're no longer out loud on this show. Because <laughs> he agrees with me. Is yeah, that why? That's why. <laughs> Oh, boy. All right, let's move on to another topic. As I mentioned, we got Star Wars Rebels, the first new episode back, A Princess on Lothal. I was so excited to see Leia in this episode. We definitely got a little bit more interaction just between Kanan and Ezra, yeah. the relationship, the partnership between the two of them. Um, I really enjoyed this episode. I think the strongest parts for me was that partnership between the two of them, which solidifies it even more for me that Ezra is not going to go <laughs> dark. No, we, we talked about this at great length on the um, Rebels recap show with myself, you and David Griffin. I'd like to get your thoughts on the episode overall. Have you seen the episode? Already? Yes. Okay, so what what did you think uh, of the episode of Princess Um, I loved it. Okay. It, it continues the trend of the, so far this season of Rebels of feeling just a little bit rushed for me, mm. probably because I want more, so I can't yeah. really fault them for that. Right. <laughs> um, I did think it was really interesting, if you look at this kind of from a meta perspective, they almost hit you over the head if you're like a steeped Star Wars fan with this is a nod to this or this isn't a nod to that. But then I think of kids who are watching this show right now. And the example I'll use is Princess Leia's theme was played a lot throughout this episode. Yeah, it was. But it's almost this subconscious way of identifying her with that theme. Mm -hmm. So if you're a kid right now who may be watching Rebels but hasn't seen you know, the original films, when she comes on and you hear those musical cues, it feels yeah. right to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's almost like Star Wars is programming you to respond well <laughs> to every other piece of Star you're Wars. You're right. And that's yeah. active tissue, man. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, you got to make the money. But it was, a, it was a really good show. I, I liked it. I like the episode i didn't love it um i thought you know i certainly put told everybody my problems in the uh in the episode i still think and, and i get it how bad and i've said this yesterday it might be one of my biggest problems i get how bad stormtroopers are with shooting but i mean these guys are i mean it's like they're <laughs> shooting with their eyes closed so um i shave your head and go to sleep shave, is your, what head he's saying. And, <laughs> shave your head and go to sleep so i i i, I do think that the and there are certain things that the Empire seems a little dopey sometimes. Granted, you weren't going up against Callus and you weren't going up against Vader. But I really liked the way they handled Leia. I thought that they handled her really well. I don't think we're going to see her for a while now, but no. you don't need to. Um, and I liked the way that they designed her at where it was, okay, this is Leia before they realize that she is indeed a rebel. She's got a, she's playing she's playing it up, and I thought that was done really well. But it's all about what's going to happen in this season now. Now that we know, that was another thing. The fact that we got that trailer a couple of days before this episode, the, the, sh the, the show itself, the episode was good, but that trailer yeah. was like movie. It was like a cinematic. So, um, okay, what's next? Uh, next up, we've got the comic book that came out, Star Wars issue 15. I just like to call this one all about Obi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what did you think? Did you Have you read this I one did, yet? yeah, I have read it. Well, there, I think everybody's read it, yeah? Did you read it I yet? haven't. You didn't read it yet, okay. I have it. But you didn't read it yet. Okay. I'm like and, well, three just, pages in. Justin and I are the professionals. We'll, we will talk about it. Um, <laughs> you want me to lie and say I did? No, no, I appreciate it. Uh, I, Shave your head and go to sleep. <laughs> that's it. I uh, really liked episode, uh, episode, I would say episode, issue seven, which was the first Obi-Wan. And the animation was very different than the, the illustrations were a yep. lot different than, than this one. There were things about this issue that I loved and part of that is the story i love the story i actually really like the scene that, that ray put up here too with, with with young bigs and and the stuff with luke um i didn't mind the illustration how like kind of clear it was i know you had maybe a little bit more yeah. of a issue with that my the problem that i the, the biggest issue i had with this issue is some of the dialogue some of the writing was some of the problems that you and I had initially with the Star Wars run, where it was like trying so to be Star Wars, like saying oh, so many of the lines. Some jokey, like, oh, thank God I'm a Jedi because now I can take the taste of Snake, and it's like, yeah, we don't need to do that. Yeah, um, let's stick to the. If you look at what the overall theme is of this 
issue and what Obi-Wan has to do and adore, endure and the fact that what he did in that last issue and how he was trying to push back being a Jedi and, and really learning how to deal with it. Now he's becoming, like, he feels like the Obi-Wan we saw in episode yeah. four. He's becoming yeah. that guy. That stuff I love. But I, I thought it was a de a decent enough. Justin? No, overall I enjoyed it. Um, I agree a little bit with the writing. It didn't bother me quite as much as it did you, but I do agree that some of those lines are a little weird. Like, oh, how do you like your snake when Uncle Owen shows yeah. up? Um, the art is very well done, but I found it a little bit too stylized for me. Some of the characters didn't feel necessarily right. And though there's a difference between art not really impacting you in a great way and it being bad. This is certainly not bad, but like Obi-Wan on the cover looks a little bit more like Vincent Price to me yeah. than he does Obi-Wan Kenobi. And yeah. just or a little like a blonde Doctor Strange. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't look like, he doesn't look like Ewan McGregor or yeah. Alec Guinness. Yeah. But then you look at other panels. My favorite actually from the entire issue is on the top right where Obi-Wan's overlooking yeah. Luke in the Skyhopper and mm -hmm. says Luke Skywalker was his father's son in so many ways. That's that's great. That's Star Wars. That's what he's there to do and yeah. he's, he's noticing and remembering his friend. Yeah. Well, and the kid doesn't look like Luke at all. But that's, no. again, going away from certain, if you want to read it for the story and of where it plays into the canon and the lore, it's a must read. Yeah. I think for the lore of Star Wars and what it is, then absolutely it's something you should pick up. Well, and I think as a comic book fan, I think it's interesting because there's a lot of people who are reading comic books now just because of the fact that they're Star Wars comic books. And so seeing the fact that there are new writers that come in, there are new artists that come in, they do a stint or they do a one-off. It's interesting hearing people's takes on when a new artist does come in or when a new writer mm -hmm. does pop in because it does really affect the story because right. they are both so tightly intertwined um, that I think it's cool hearing you guys talk about how the art affected you, if you like it, or liked it or you didn't. I want to see what you think of it. So you're going to yeah. you read it on yeah. the plane of Sundance. Yep, I will. All right, what's uh, what's next? All right, next up, I am so excited about this news because he was one of my favorite characters coming out of The Force Awakens. Poe Dameron is getting his own comic book, and it is an ongoing series that is going to start in April. Um, it looks like this one is going to be the comic that actually replaces the Kanan comic book series because that one is ending in March. Mm. Um, this one says that it's going to take place, uh, start right around the time before The Force Awakens. Awakens, um, which I think is really interesting because we got a little bit more of Poe's story prior to what we saw mm -hmm. in the movie in the book, The Force Awakens. So I'm curious to see where they're going to pick up and what kind of stuff they're going to put in the comic book based off of that. How do you feel about this news? I love it. I just I, I wish that Kanan wasn't the sacrifice of it because I love <laughs> the Kanan comic. It was one of my favorites that were out there. So it, it's sad to see that one go, but it's great. Poe, I, I love, and I think it's in everything that we've seen so far, not only in in um, The Force Awakens novel, but in The Shattered Empire, even though he's, it's the beginning of his parents. Um, and then you also have the Journey to The Force Awakens book that that Greg Rucker wrote that you also get a little bit more of him. So mm -hmm. he's a character that should be explored more. I think this is great news. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm a little bit more excited for who's writing it than I am the fact that it's a title. Chuck Soul, who wrote Lando and is currently writing Anakin and Obi-Wan. Dude is my favorite Star Lando's Wars great. writer right now yeah. in comics. Lando was the biggest surprise out of comic. Yeah. I'm sorry, out That's of canon so far. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was only five issues. It just oh, came out really? as yeah. a collected trade paperback. but. Oh, what a fantastic it. story. If you haven't read it, you absolutely need to. Well, that would answer um, a question why I haven't been able to see, get, read another one. That's what <laughs> <laughs> but then it also pairs Phil Noto with him. And I think, you know, respect, but Phil Noto got the short end of the art straw because his art was paired with Chewbacca, which was great uh, for a first issue. The story yeah. kind of went off the rails a little bit for me as it went on. So a little bit. This, you know, you know I'm, I'm nice. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the dream team, and they've got a dream character. And on top of all of that, if it continues on as an ongoing series, are we going to get events from after the force awakens as well good call i would yeah. love to see what's I mean, going I think on after we the will, but i think it's going to be i think it's going to be dependent on how much time they're willing to put into each time span they're willing to put into each comic yeah. um because generally i mean it would be we could go like tons of issues before we even get yeah. to the end That's of true. the force That's awakens true. um okay so that is everything in the world of canon now this is the point of the show where we get to hear from you guys you guys always tweet us out and you hashtag collider jedi council we go through them we pick out a bunch some great questions tiffany what is up first all right so our first one is from mikey nancy 
Nancy? At not sure. Nancy 10. Yeah. Not sure how to pronounce the last name. Sorry. Uh, but he asked Christian Harloff, what are your top five canon books every Star Wars reader should invest in? Okay. So the way I'm going to do this now is that I'm not, you gotta, I'm not going to include like some of the young reader runs of short ones, by, which are great by Greg Rucka and Jason Fry, which have, you know, the mm-hmm. Weapon of Jedi. Uh, not Weapon of Jedi. Um, yeah. Weapon of, uh, yeah. Weapon of Jedi. Um, and then you Smuggler's Run, Moving Target, and Journey, Journey of the Force Awakens. Those are all ones that are really good. They're shorter reads. They're not like necessarily the novels. Another one is a short story, which is a perfect weapon, which I just recently, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. I really enjoyed that one. You get a little bit of maybe how they found Vader's mask, which I thought was really cool. So these are the five novels that I would recommend for canon. And then I want to get Justin's take as well and Tiffany's. But starting at number five for me, we just talked about it before, is Battlefront. Um, Alexander Freed wrote Battlefront, and it was something I was not looking forward to at all. It felt like Band of Brothers in the Star Wars. Wars world and it really introduced some brand new characters um, brought back some old canon characters in regards to it by mention only in Count Vidian which I thought was really mm-hmm. cool so that's one I would recommend if you just want to read a cool Star Wars um, story Four is Dark Disciple which I was a big Clone Wars fan of Asajj Ventress and Quinlan Voss. It follows their story. I thought it followed it well. It was an unfinished story that was actually written by George Lucas's daughter which I th- uh, with the that not the novel itself but the the script the the uh, novel was written by Christy Golden and you should check that out number three is Tarkin James Lucino is one of my favorite Star Wars writers of all time of course wrote the now Legends book Darth Plagueis which I love very much um, but he wrote Tarkin and you like Darth Plagueis I do did you know that <laughs> uh, now Tarkin Tarkin is one that it's it's a bit it's a bit wordy it's a bit uh, there's a lot of detail to it but you really find out who the man is and exactly why Tarkin and Vader why Tarkin's able to talk to the Vader the way that he does so Tarkin's one number two you you have talked you've heard me talk about this book on so blue in the face and that's lost stars um lost stars is another one i i i was walking by said ah you know it's canon so i'll read it and it turned out to i just fell in love with it i if i could sometimes put this on my number one it's so good it follows through the Mm -hmm. entire trilogy even past the trilogy the original trilogy and it's um it, it really claudia gray has such a lock on Star Wars, and it is such a blessing that she's going to be writing Bloodline, which mm-hmm. comes out in uh, May, I believe, or May or maybe even July. I don't remember. They pushed it back. Finally, is Lords of the Sith. Lords of the Sith by Paul Kemp is the story of Vader and um, Palpatine, kind of stranded. Mm-hmm. But it really is the story about Cham Sudala, who is Hera's father, and you get to see him inside of that. Uh, trailer that we saw in Rebels so if you want to know a little bit more about Cham Sudala and I recommend doing that I would read this book but I would also go back and watch some of the Clone Wars so that's my list uh, Justin what's your top five yeah I'm gonna start out by echoing uh, Lords of the Sith for Cham Sundula reasons I had it on my list as well at I'm, one uh, no not at one okay. I'm just this is no Lords specific, of the Sith. No order. specific order He's oh, no, order. no order, no order. No order. Okay. just throwing them out um so Kind, it's not a novel, but the Force Awakens Visual Dictionary, oh, your so viewing good. experience is only 85% okay. complete until you have actually poured through this book. Read it and then go back and watch The Force Awakens and tell me that the experience is not better for having read this book by a Lucasfilm story group's Pablo Hidalgo. It's awesome. Um, Rise of the Empire is a collection of Tarkin, which Christian recommended, and also A New Dawn by John Jackson Miller. But it's also it's not so much for those two novels that I'm recommending it. The short story in there are amazing specifically the levers of power by jason fry who you also mentioned Mm -hmm. is a story that places a new character ray sloan at the battle of endor uh one of my favorite things about the new canon is that they're treating star wars to a great extent as if it's a real world kind of situation a little bit more visceral a little less fantastical um if you take the battle of endor and then you put this new character in there and you see the Battle of Endor from Return of the Jedi through her eyes, it's a completely different experience and I really enjoyed listening, or rather reading it, Mm -hmm. and then seeing, well you got me. uh, Audibling is what he means. And then seeing it, in the, in the book. It was really, really good. Um, I'm also going to recommend a comic, Son of Dathomir. I know it's, oh, yeah. again, not a novel, but with yeah. Maul coming up in the Clone Wars, if you haven't read this and you're only familiar with him from the Clone Wars, this is te- this tells you what happens to him after we last see him in the Clone Wars mm-hmm. and is going to be, I think, pretty soon, required reading before you watch him in Rebels. Um, my last two is Aftermath. 
I know it does not necessarily have the best reputation, but there is so much gold buried inside of that novel that if you take your time with it, I think it's a rewarding experience. And then finally, Jason Fry's it's young reader books, but he has a series called Servants of the Empire that features Zero Leonis from Rebels. It's a great tie into Rebels. It even ties into The Force Awakens in some ways. Mm-hmm. Great book. So that's my list. Which one was that? Uh, it's called Servants of the Empire. Servants it's a five book series. It's okay. great. And that's you'll new you'll canon. love it. Yeah, it's new oh, canon. Okay. Yeah. General Hux's father is in it. I missed how totally missed that one. See, this is why <laughs> it schools me on this stuff. Yeah, um, mine are going to be in no particular order, but first I have to talk about Shattered Empire um, comic books, which yeah. counts for me. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, because, like I said earlier, it just revealed stuff about the Force that we didn't know before, which I thought was really exciting. Um, then I have to do a new dawn, which I know Christian's not the no, biggest I, fan I, of. I'm not, no, it can't be a hate. Set. I, I think I think it's I, it was that was the first one I did the audio book for and yeah. read along with it at the same the time. The audio book yeah. is great, and yeah. I think I actually think it been and I read it before Rebels even came out. Yeah. I actually think that people would enjoy that, and I thought it had a great villain with Count Vidian. Yeah. I don't mind that book as much. It just happens yeah. to not be one of my favorites. Well, and I think that for me is what. Add, it's just such an added layer for Rebels because you get to see Kanan before he becomes who we know him to be now in Rebels yeah. and it just made me connect to that character so much more and love him that much more. Um, and then I have to say Lost Stars. Um, reading that book for me, it was so interesting because yes, it is a younger book, but the fact that they could put a love story intertwined within everything going on in the galaxy and having it still focus on the war that's going on was so awesome. She does such a great job writing this book and I'm really excited to see where it goes next because it ends and you're like, but what, what, yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> Which I think there was a quote that I read the other day that was like, uh, every every book written by a good writer makes you feel like it's too short. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one definitely made me feel that way. And then I've got to go Lords of the Sith. Um, I loved seeing the interaction between the Emperor and Vader. And, you know, I talked about it a little bit earlier in the show, but being able to see Vader kind of balancing both sides of himself, that he goes back and, like, remembers things from his past, but is still trying to remain Vader, the Vader that we end up knowing in the original film. So I loved that. Um, and and it's it was just... There were parts of it that were just fun, where there be there's chase sequences, there's stuff in there that as you're reading it, it's just like so fast paced and interesting. So I really, really enjoyed that one. And then the last one I'm gonna say is The Force Awakens. I think that for anybody who loved the movie, it adds a layer to the movie that you don't get just watching it. I mean, Christian and I were even talking right before the show that they never mention that Leia and Han were married. In the book, they say that they were husband and wife. Um, There's little snippets here and there where they describe a little bit more about R2-D2 and him waking up instead of it feeling a little bit like Mm -hmm. in the film, oh, they just showed up and now he's awake. Um, So I think you get a lot more layers in that book. And that for me is one of the things when you're doing the books, I don't want to feel like I have to read them to make something better. But if I read it, I want to have it add something to it. So those are my top five. Great choices. So if you guys have read any of the canon novels out there, what are your favorites? Go ahead and comment and tell us exactly which ones you would recommend to your other Star Wars fans who are looking to find them. All right, Tiff, what's next? Our next one is from Darth Tyrannus or Sith Lord. I would just say Smith Lord 510. It wasn't for me, though. <laughs> <laughs> who asks, there's an image, and he says, Snoke during the Clone Wars? Now, for those of you who don't know who that is, that is not the Inquisitor from the Rebels. Mm-hmm. That is the son from the Mortis episodes in the Clone Wars, which is one of my favorite angles in the entire Clone Wars. Absolutely. So great and really played into the lore of Star Wars and even gave us our first kind of vision, even showed Anakin himself kind of his first vision of what he was ultimately going to become. Um, now, this is an interesting one. Now, now I don't think that this is going to be Snoke at all, but it, it, playing devil's advocate, if you think that it, it could be, the reason why I think this is a better argument than, say, the Inquisitor or Kanan or Ezra, Ezra. or even Plagueis. I even think he's more because the the thing is he is old. He is an the, the son is old and has been around for a long time. Uh, Andy Serkis has said that that Snoke is old and has been around for a long time <laughs> and has seen it. In the novel, Snoke is is very aware of what happened with Vader and the Emperor and how he turned and and he had a great career until that one moment. This guy would know that. He'd seen Anakin. Everything. He knew Anakin. He watched it. So do I think it's him? No. But if it was, would I be cool with it? Yeah, I would. How do you feel? Um, I do not think it's him. Yeah. 
I would not be cool with it, yeah. only because if I'm remembering correctly, and it's been way too long since I've watched Mortis, which is sad because it really is one of the best of the Clone Season Wars. Season three, I believe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the son and the daughter and the father were like luminous being type mm-hmm. things that could manifest themselves in mm-hmm. a physical form. And Snoke, somebody tore him up. So I don't yeah. know what happened to him. But I, and not only that, but Snoke seemed to me in the film to need Kylo Ren for some reason. And then Han Solo even refers to it. He's going to use you until he doesn't need you anymore. So right. I don't know what that like relationship Voldemort. is. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, you know, and looks too. Um, so there's some kind of relationship there where it seems like Snoke needs him, yeah. and I don't think the son would need him. Unless something happens when he got really weak, but we don't know how, what yeah. happens. I mean, but I, I think agree with you. you talk about, too, the fact that they had to, they could manifest themselves, but they weren't always in that form. And so mm. that, to me, do I think it's this character? I don't know. Could it be interesting? Is there a lot of stuff that would lead me to think possibly? I mean, the fact that he's saying he has to use Kylo could be that because he can't manifest in a physical form that he's like, this is my conduit to get everything done in the physical realm until I'm powered up enough to actually manifest nice. myself like, again. Like All right. What's uh, what's next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. me. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, we've got a question from at Darth Donaba. Who asks, how long after the events of episode seven do you think the story will pick up in episode eight? Can it be a record short time frame? I love this question because the reason the question is asked, obviously, if you look at any one of the Star Wars movies, they jump. Like episode one mm-hmm. to two is 10 years. I think episode two to three is, was it two or three, is three years. Uh, and then the you know, same thing, four or five. There's always these jumps in years. Personally, I think it'll be about a year or so, but I, I'd like to see it take place right from that island like right away like just go right into it i don't think it's going to happen because they, they just i think ray's going to be th- through about a year of her training i don't want it to jump two three years because i don't want to see i, I want to see her training with luke yeah. i want to mm-hmm. see how it's going to go down so i think a year is enough time it also gives us enough time to set up finn is is recovered and he's he's doing missions now with poe he's part of the resistance you give me about a year i, I can buy the finn now is is full-fledged part of the resistance so i think year is a good time what do you think um i think the way the film ends there's such a sense of urgency with you know the first order and snoke and being like get me kylo ren mm-hmm. um and so i think it is going to be a short amount of time I would think it was awesome if it picks up immediately after, but at the same time, I do think it would be nice to have that kind of nothing. I'm going to say I don't want to see more than a year just because of the fact that if it is more than that, we're going to need flashbacks because I'm going to want to see Ray being trained or not being trained. We don't know. Um, And I want to see Kylo completing whatever Snoke is completing in him. Um, So I think, yeah, we could get a record short amount of time from episode seven to episode eight. Yes, agreed. I'd say a year to two years uh, for the reasons that both of you have said. But then the only other one that I I didn't hear yet is the galaxy is reeling from the fact that the government that was controlling them is gone. Right. So they've made a lot of mention about the the proxy war between the First Order and the Resistance. So if the First Order has more forces someplace out there, obviously they do because Snoke has to recall these guys to someplace. Then what happens to the Resistance side of things? Are you recruiting other people who now see that the First Order is actually a threat? The stakes on a galactic government war kind of level need to be raised a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I think they need a little bit of time to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, what's next? Uh, Our next one is from Dusty Pearson who asks, Collider Jedi Council, what's the best info or reveal you've received in the new canon? For me, it's Boba Fett telling Vader that Luke is a Skywalker. I like that reveal as well, but Mm -hmm. I think the one that I really liked was one of the first ones that I read because I knew what I was in for as far as new canon goes, and that was in Tarkin when I found out that in Coruscant, the Jedi Temple was built underneath a Sith Temple. I was like, no, that's fantastic, (laughs) and that makes so much sense, and and now I understand so much more how Palpatine was ever able to pull him, why he was so powerful in the Jedi Temple when he... Or in, in those buildings and in Coruscant, why he drew so much strength there and why he decided to set up there. Um, I loved that. I thought that reveal was great. Now, you, I, I'm going to guess you're going to pull some <laughs> Aftermath stuff. I'm not, actually. No. Um, okay. I was I was tempted to say from Darth, uh, not Darth Plagueis, from Tarkin, 
the fact that Palpatine's main goal was to reshape reality. He was into some crazy stuff yeah. that was really big. But I'm going to go with the emotional choice of Lando and Lobot's friendship from oh, Lando. Yeah, yeah. That it was completely unexpected for me for two characters who I appreciate but never had any real affinity for. But mm -hmm. the friendship that forms the core of that story was honestly so touching that it changes the way I watch their scenes in The Empire Strikes Back now. And I mean, when you've been watching Star Wars for 30 plus years and you get a new layer to put into a film that you've seen hundreds of times, that's a gift. So I got to mm -hmm. say that's it. And going off that Lando comic as well, too, I think that what I loved is the fact that they were able to, you know, I think why Lando was such a great comic was because it didn't just go, oh, it wasn't just Lando being Lando. Yeah. It, was, it was Lando being Lando, but also the fact that they were hijacking Emperor Palpatine's yeah. ship and there were so many Sith artifacts and all that stuff, that was an interesting yeah. thing. What was, what um, I would say two things, but one, the first one I think that really blew me away was when we had the whole big to-do about Han Solo maybe having been <laughs> married before, um, just because of the fact that it was, look what this comic book can do and how much it can yeah. shake up yeah. all of us as fans and how excited we were about possibly having this new storyline. How it played out, different. But at the same time, I think it was really exciting having that reveal in there. And then I know I keep going back to Shattered Empire, but uh, again, I think finding out who Poe's parents were um, and that it had such an impact on me on a, based off of a character that I barely knew, but I was like, oh my gosh, now we know his backstory. So those were the two big reveals for me. And yes, they come from comics. Yeah. Well, it's also, and I think you got to go Lost Stars also. So you get to find out how some of those ships crashed in, uh, in Jakku. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Um, okay, what's next? All right, so our next one is from Emily Van Nader, who says, do you think we'll find out Leia is pregnant in the second Aftermath book? The timeline is most likely right for it. I hope so. I, I think it's a good possibility. I mean, at least at least a mention, you know, if they're if it's if it's based off of it's called life debt. So you're assuming it's going to be about Chewie and Han. So there's going to be a lot of conversations with Han. And I think because we now know that and I think that's part of the plan with when when Chuck Wending was brought into it. It's like, OK, look, you're going to you be able to tell this is only so much you can tell in the first one. But the movie will have come out yeah. by the time you release the second. And then you're allowed to say this and this. And Han Solo will be dead at that point. So you can go and do some more <laughs> stuff and. I th I think we'll hear about it. I know it. we're all okay with it, but I hate when people when we just say it like Han Solo is dead. dead. <laughs> He's coming back for a flashback. He'll be fine. What do you? What about you? Um, what do I think? I I mean I think that yeah we'll probably get something alluding to that. I think what excites me more is just even learning more about Leia kind of during that period. Yeah. Obviously I want to see the stuff with Han and Chewie, but um, we kind of glossed over all of the stuff of one, her finding out that she's force sensitive and then the relationship developing even more with Han. So, I mean, yeah, I think we'll probably get to that point in the book too. Yeah, really quick. Greg Rucka is the man to write that uh, conversation, by the way. Great interview on StarWars.com with Dan Brooks. Um, yes, I do think it's Han Solo centric. It takes, uh, it grows out of one of the interludes from Aftermath. Yes, I think we find out that she's pregnant. And I kind of like, it, I would kind of like it if Ben was born in the next one, Empire's End. I like that that's the title, and I like that it's really the birth of somebody who is on a mission to bring but, the Empire back. Well, Empire's End is, is the which? third. The third after oh, the yeah. third book, yeah. Right, right. Okay. Um, okay, what's next? We got our, uh, three more. Our next one is from At the Fire of Belden, who asks... Is the SNL sketch canon now? <laughs> um, it certainly is not, but it certainly was amazing. Oh it was a God. lot of fun. And if you don't know what he's talking about, just check out Kylo Ren, Undercover Boss, the Saturday Night Live sketch they just did. Another one I was tweeted about quite often with the Is This Canon Now, which is pretty funny. But I, the man, it, it, was, it was a blast. I, I, had, I, had a, I really got a kick out of it. I, the, the ones that got me was when they, with Leslie uh, Jones would say, I got to get my muffin. I need to get my muffin, and then they <laughs> kick away. They kick away his his, his wrench, and he gets all pissed off. It, it's a really funny skit, and one of the better ones that Saturday Night Live's done in a while. What'd you think about Justin? Yeah, no, I loved it for the for the same reasons, obviously, and I love the new Kylo Ren at the end when he leaves and the camera pans down to the Imperial who's dead. Yeah, that was hilarious to me. Um, if you've never seen Undercover Boss, it's basically Kylo Ren taking off his helmet and being you know just another worker yeah. <laughs> um and it is so funny and what i loved about it is the fact that adam driver committed to it yeah, you know well, yeah, you see did. the the beginning where he's sitting down and talking about you know what he's gonna do and then he really wants to see what it's like and he has like his eye twitches at one point which you're like 
dude, this guy is like, he's doing the work that he did on Force yeah, Awakens lockdown. for this SNL Talks sketch. Talks with him with the gritted teeth. Yeah. There too. yeah. Which it's so much fun. And yeah, you can find those all on YouTube. And then what I thought it did even more too was the fact that Disney is willing to let SNL really play with their properties because not only did he do this sketch but they also did aladdin which was really funny, mm, was funny. um but i think it, it's just exciting because it's like now we can have even more sketches whenever they have um force awakens or star wars actors on that i think will be really fun to see all right let's politely say no to the next question uh <laughs> the question was any chance that ezra is snoke which uh, no we <laughs> which we have all <laughs> talked about i think uh you say no i say no no Okay. All right, there's All right. that. One. All right, last one. <laughs> and our last question comes from Call Heron, who says, "From one to ten, what do you think the chances that we'll see how Chewie meets Han in the Solo movie?" Nine, eight, nine. All right, that's our show. Uh, <laughs> so that is Collider Jedi Council. I would like to thank the council today. First, she is the Smith Lord. Tiffany Smith, where can I find you? You guys can find me on social media and Snapchat as well at Tiffany's Tweets. Um, you can check me out uh, today. There's actually a new episode up of Movie Threesome on Movie Clips on YouTube with Christian Harloff. And we're actually heading up to Sundance to have awesome Movie Threesome episodes all week from up in Utah. And DC All Access is back. We just shot our first episodes of 2016 today, so be on the lookout for those. And sitting next to Tiffany, it's Justin Boulder. Justin, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at StarWarsWithFriends.com. You can also find me on Twitter at TheApexFan or Facebook.com forward slash TheApexFan. And you guys, make sure that you comment. Let us know all the topics that we talked about today, which ones you guys want to talk about the most. Chat with your fellow Star Wars fans below. And if you have Star Wars fans that don't know about Collider Jedi Council, let them know about it. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff. We will be back next Thursday with Obi-John Kenobi and Mark 2D2. May the Force be with you, always. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.